Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining the session and Chrome University. Uh, hope you're enjoying your time learning a lot about Chrome OS. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the history of Chromebooks. But before we do that, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Howard Lee. I'm a product manager on the Chrome OS team, looking into various technology areas ranging from biometrics, uh, gaming, and sensors. So today, uh, we want to share with what the genesis of what Chrome OS was to become what it is today and our journey in building this really exciting web first cloud first platform that is now synonymous with you know tech and education and affordability as well it's been a decade almost of hard work as we and as we look toward our 10th anniversary soon uh, we couldn't be happier with the impact we've had around in the world in, in the world of compute so in this session we'll go through the various devices that we launched each year um, and the important milestones that we had, the, the defining moments that really shaped who we are today. By knowing the history, we, we hope you can understand the trajectory of we, where we are headed as Chrome OS and the principles by which we stand when we think about building transformative compute experiences. So the device you see here on this slide is actually the first device that we have ever shipped called CR48. Uh, and we'll, we'll touch upon this device a little more. There's a lot of back end story behind this, but let's go back to the year of 2009. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but that's when netbooks first came out. These were super low end one gigabyte RAM devices with an Atom CPU that were taking the market by storm. Uh, they were selling up to 26 million in 2009, as you can see on this chart, and on a trajectory to even reach 32 million units by 2010. The progression was rapid. It was nearly 100% growth year on year up until 2010. But the, the, the market decided to take another direction, and hint, Chrome OS had a lot to do with this too. Underpowered with smaller keyboards, as you can see on a device here, and tinier screens, we as, as Google saw an opportunity. We could have made something similar like this, but we wanted to apply our unique perspective and build something higher quality uh, and that can still be affordable and still be light, really maintaining the value proposition of why netbooks were attractive in the first place. Uh, by 2012, the word netbook is seldomly used, and that's only two or three years after it reached its peak. And, and though HP tried to re-enter this market in 2014, this market did uh, start to decline uh, as, as it started to lose out in kind of the design, uh, the ease of use aspects, and, and the portability with the advent of tablets into the market and other low-cost devices. So in a time where notebooks were starting to take off, uh, which is in 2010, we, we began an experiment, uh, a pilot program in 2010. Uh, as Google, we decided to build an eight hour battery life device with 16 to 10 display aspect ratio, because clearly the web wasn't horizontal. Uh, it had a two by two Wi-Fi module and a full size keyboard and it was built with an x86 Intel Pine Trail SoC. Uh, this part was the Atom N455, which, which was a single core processor at the time. And, and as you can see, the design was minimal and it was all black and completely unbranded. It was an experiment that, you know, in some ways broke convention because it, we rebuilt the keyboard. So for example, we replaced certain keys with shortcut keys and this is where uh, we just wanted to kind of jump into this market and see what we can do here. It was named after Chromium 48, uh, CR48, an unstable isotope of, of the metallic element Chromium. Uh, and we know that the Chromium family is also joining us here today, so welcome. This device was called this, and it was, again, it was a first attempt to test our operating system and, and our hardware as well. And because this was a pilot program to market this, we distributed this to nearly 60,000 folks for free and asked for feedback. It was meant for testing only and not really for retail sales. 
Uh, and so we gave this device away to influencers, potential customers, and people who are most likely to give feedback. And, and we learned so much this process. Some quotes that demonstrate how the market reacted to this interesting new kind of endeavor from Google. The machine, quote, met the basic requirements of web surfacing, gaming, and personal productivity, but really falls short for more intensive tasks that one may expect. Um, and so we look at more kind of reception that we saw from the market. It, it was a market that was really filled with skepticism at the time. Uh, a Wired article in 2010 says, for Google's notebook, the internet isn't everything, it's the only thing. Uh, and, and if you look deeper into this article, some of the comments is, that they say is, quote, the CR48 or whatever it ends up being called is really a notebook only in the sense that it has keyboard and a hinge which, which lets it fold in half. So there was a lot of commentary around the fact that the device is not as useful without an inter internet connection. Uh, and we tried to address this by demonstrating an offline version of Google Docs and announcing a 3G plan for this device as well. And, and some also saw promise here. Uh, the security model was praised and many thought a device like this can appeal to some niche audiences who, who may really only need a browser or even companies that rely on web applications. So this is when we realized, you know, we have a long way to go, but our idea may have legs and continued to pursue uh, this, this project. So 2011, the following year, we launched our first OEM devices. From CR48, we upgraded to more cores, lower frequency, and better performance uh, because we wanted to respond to all the feedback that we got on CR48. The two devices that came about was the Samsung Chromebook 5, which you see on the left, and the Acer AC700. They were both within the range of $350 to $450, and they were both based on the Intel Pine Trail uh, CPU. And on these devices, we led with the longer than usual battery life than what was available on the market and the fast startup. Uh, so users can get started in less than 10 to 15 seconds and get to browsing as quickly as possible. So these devices also had a higher RAM, uh, two gigabytes, as well as uh, uh, an SSD that got up to about 16 gigabytes. So these devices did again face mixed reception. And this is also when we saw promise in the education sector. By partnering with programs like Chromebooks and Education, uh, Google Chromebooks really had a chance of excelling in the education sector because these were also low cost devices that, that schools and public health systems can afford. The strong signals came in our sales where by the end of 2011, we placed nearly 27,000 plus Chromebooks in schools across the majority of states, about 41 states, uh, including kind of being the device for many one-to-one -one programs. So false fun fact, the Acer AC700 uh, had a predecessor that, that didn't quite make it. Uh, it was called the ZGA uh, as opposed to ZGB, which is the device that we actually ended up shipping. Uh, and that's because we wanted to process all the uh, feedback that we got from the CR48 experiment and, and just make a better, better device that was well suited for our users' needs. So this is when it was a small inflection point with Acer's AC700 shipping the market admittedly said they wrote off Chrome OS a little too quickly than they should have. Tony Bradley from PC World thought these web-centric notebooks were doomed to fail, but they were surprised by the warm embrace of the market where this device essentially landed on Amazon's bestseller list. Now, this really energized our team and we needed to capitalize on this momentum. So the journey continued and led us to 2012 where it was full of new endeavors, new experiments. We branched into building ARM devices and diversifying our form factors as well. So, and of course we made large strides in, in our open source experiment as well. There were a series of Samsung devices that was launched in this year, uh, the Chromebook series three and the Chromebook series five. These were all based on the Intel Sandy Bridge SOC. And it was the first devices to have our own firmware. And despite a lot of skepticism on our ability to build uh, a homegrown her firmware, we were able to pull this off. And this was something that we were very happy about. And of course, this was also our first attempt at a Chromebox. It's the first device that you see here on the left. Uh, it's a mini PC form factor that has carved out its own space in the market today as a compact, mountable, and portable form factor that has served a lot of commercial use cases, such as 
kiosk signage and a lot of front of office use cases. Then there was our first ARM-based device uh, at only $200, Daisy, as we call it internally, which was based on the Exynos 5250. And the device had this really iconic hinge and that it stuck out in the back. Uh, but it was also a critical milestone for us that, that symbolized the first time where we were able to open source all the way through the stack. The success of this gave us confidence on doing open source on EC, though EC tends to have a lot of long tail bugs, but it was, it was a great first step. And for the operating system, Aura was a version of Chrome OS that we rolled out in 2012. It had a completely revamped UI that felt more like a desktop and not just a browser. Uh, so we can convey that this, we can do more than just browse and the basic kind of browser activities. In the market, we also made great headway in education again. In a year, we were the device of choice for over 500 school districts across the US and even Europe. And at around $299 for Chromebooks, they, they were not only just affordable, but it, it allowed students to access all information by just signing into their Chrome account. Uh, and but, but we still had a long way to go. Uh, and Though we sold about 400,000 plus units in 2012, the market share was still fairly low at this point. And a small backstory, in the end of 2011 holiday season leading into 2012, we were also looking to show ship two more devices that were named Cain and Abel. These devices were supposed to be ARM-based devices, but after continued iteration and just going through a lot of scrutiny, the devices simply did not have good enough performance based on the team's assessment. I think this was a really interesting kind of point for us because it's, re it's, it's representative of how un un uncompromising we are in our commitment to quality. And we refuse to and continue to refuse to today to ship devices that do not meet the standards uh, that we believe these devices should uphold. So next up, 2013, um, it's, it's, we've been in the game for about three, four years now. And this was the year where we ventured into the world of building premium Chromebooks, where we built the first, first party Chromebook that was more than $1,000, which was kind of shocking to the market at the time. It was called the Google Chromebook Pixel. Uh, it had a very high PPI, uh, thir three to two display ratio, where the only other in that displays were from Apple at the time, as well as an LTE SKU. This had the highest pixel density than any other laptop in the market at the, at the time. And the exterior was described by wires as an austere rectangular block of aluminum with subtly rounded edges. So there's a little black story here too. There was a predecessor to this device called Stanley, which had a three to two regular resolution display using an ARM processor, but that never escaped the lab because Again, similar with um, Kane and Abel, it did not meet our performance bar at the time. And again, this was a lesson to us to realize that it takes a few tries really to get something right. We also shipped the Chrome, HP Chromebook 11 G1, the device that you see on the right side. It was the first to be powered by the USB micro B and it was almost entirely built by the Chrome OS team. Uh, we made the device in all Google colors. As you can see, it's some hints of blue, red, and yellow on the keyboard, but there was a black version as well. Um, some small anecdote, we wanted to do a pink version of the inlay as well, but that never actually kind of took flight. 2013 represented a lot of milestones for us where we did, again, first top to bottom open source, including the EC. And the HP device was the first device with a single power data video port, uh, the US micro B. Our volume of sales was also increasing. Nearly 1.76 million Chromebooks were sold in the US, representing about 20 or so percent of the commercial B2B laptop market. But Pixel had a bit of a different fate, where by 2016, uh, just after three years of launch, we decided to. Uh, discontinue the device and continue our focus on other devices. 2014 rolled around very quickly and we shipped more devices, including the first ever NVIDIA ARM device that was based on Tegra K1. 
as well as version two uh, of the HP Chromebook that was released a year before. For the NVIDIA device, there were they were big and Blaze. Those are the names of the devices uh, that we had internally, and it had 13-inch Full HD displays priced at entry level at nearly 299. And the Rev two of the HP device was also released internally called Kit, where it, we had created a device with a nice keyboard, trackpad, and, and an ID that was kind of very polished. HP wanted to fine tune a lot of things on this device. Uh, the device essentially had the same components, which meant for we were able to leverage a lot of the supply across two devices. In the background, we were working on version two of the high-end Pixel we shipped the previous year, uh, as well as working on bringing USB-C. And Chrome OS uh, on this year really became a major system contributor to the USB spec. In the market, we launched an app designed for teachers called Google Classroom to further lean into our strengths in education. This was a big moment for teachers because this app helped create and distribute assignments in a paperless way. And we also decided to uphold stricter privacy standards for students by prohibiting any use of email information for advertising purposes. These efforts all culminated into very positive outcomes in the education step space where Chromebooks overtook competitor device in the classroom and there were reports of test scores improving dramatically with schools that adopted browser only devices, again, Chromebooks. <clears throat> this article from PC World captures the dramatic growth that we were experiencing at this time. The title shows Chromebooks rising, SteamOS stalling, et cetera. It was a huge inflection point where Chromebook shipments in classroom leapfrogged iPad and we reached nearly 50% of the EDU market. 2015, uh, as mentioned before, in 2014, we were working on the second version of Pixel 2 and we were able to finally launch this device on the Intel Broadwell platform. It was also a year where we built a convertible, the first one that, that can work both as a tablet and a clamshell. And this Asus device was based on Rockchip 3288 and ARM architecture SOC and it had this sleek aluminum body and, and a hybrid hinge. That same year, we launched a $85 device, the cheapest device that we've ever shipped. And it looks pretty much like a USB stick, as you can see on the, on the image on the right. Uh, but you plug it into a monitor or any sort of screen with a USB port, and it can become a laptop. And you can run Chrome OS on it. With a single USB port, it, it expanded the breadth of form factors we supported in Chrome OS. Out in the market, our sales were continuing to increase where shipments reached nearly 6.4 million units with, again, double digit increase. Schools, again, exhibited strong preference for Chromebooks over iPad because of its ease of deployment and also the general low cost of ownership that every, everybody knows about. Enterprises had not warmed up to Chromebooks yet fully at this time, but we noticed a lot of traction and the interest was growing. 2015 was also the year where we launched Pixel C based on the Tegra X1 SOC. It was categorized as an Android tablet, actually, not, not a Chrome OS device. And it, deemed the it was deemed the predecessor of the Pixel Slate that came later. With an octa-core NVIDIA SOC, the Pixel C shipped with like the Android 6.0.1 Marshmallow uh, operating system. And this tablet essentially can attach to a keyboard magnetically via a hinge, as you can see on this image here, and the keyboard would connect via Bluetooth. So it had a lot of really cool features, like an on-tap feature where a long tap of the home button would trigger a search. This collaboration with the Android team really helped familiarize the Chrome OS team with the Android ecosystem and paved the way of some really interesting development in the next few years, like let's say maybe Android apps into Chrome OS. By 2016, uh, Chromebooks became ubiquitous in the EDU market, Google Chromebooks, according to CNBC, made up nearly half of the US classroom. We essentially went from less than 1% just four years ago to more than half, which was such an incredible milestone for us that, that really got the team excited. This news was shocking to the market. It was a tidal wave of Chromebooks. Uh, that had the market really scratching their heads. And to quote an analyst, he said, Chromebooks made an incredibly 
quick inroad in just a couple years, leaping over its competitors with seeming ease. We did, we certainly didn't expect this level of adoption and it was something that we wanted to continue. 2016 was a really big year of experimentation by our partners. A Braswell reference was independently built by our partner Intel. And it was also the year where we launched Acer Chromebook 15 and Asus Chromebook C2025A that were based on Broadwell and Braswell SOCs respectively. Battery life continued to be our strengths and continued to make devices. We continue to make devices with durable and modular design. One of the greatest milestones of 2016 is that um, we brought the Play Store onto Chrome OS. We wanted to further our collaboration with the Android team while closing the app gap. By bringing on the Play Store, users now were able to do things like Skype calls. With, and at the time, Skype was really pervasive in the market and also work with Office files, really improving our productivity capabilities that was important to our users. Sales-wise, the education sector was buying up more Chromebooks than ever. And it was the year when we overtook Mac shipments to become the second most popular PC operating system in the US. And again, Engadget highlighted this, where a recent IDC study pointed to this very fact. In, in 2016, more Google Chromebooks were sold in the first quarter of 2016 than the competitive desktop. Um, the milestone marked the first time Google's Chrome OS moved more units than, than OS, OS X in the US. 2017 was the year where we launched yet another well-reviewed kind of pixel book device. It's a first party Chromebook that started at $999. Uh, the device had the design language of Google and it also had some very interesting facets like the silicon palm rest um, that was that caused a really interesting kind of touch and feel to the device uh, and an incredibly thin design with a really high quality display. The device is often always on the list of the very best Chromebook us users can buy for from a, a lot of our viewers and continues to be a fan favorite. In the market, during the BET conference, which is the largest education conference today, we launched a new fleet of Chromebooks for education devices. These This portfolio consisted of a versatile set of devices with greater performance, a lot more mobility, that would really facilitate a range of classroom applications. Fun tools like browser-based Google Earth was offered this year to really fortify the teachers with the tools to make teaching easier. And the culmination of all these efforts led to yet again, double digit sales growth for, for our business. 2018, uh, in the following year, we also made a lot of waves by creating our first go at a premium convertible. That didn't look a lot like our mid-tier devices that fall that fell between four to six hundred dollars. This was called the HP Chromebook X2. Uh, it had a stylus, some very nice speakers from Bang and Olufsen, and the premium look and feel that really HP is known for. And of course, there was also, if you see on the right, the first ever first party Pixel Slate tablet um, that was launched later that year. This had a premium metallic build, a molecular display, and as well as the first ever fingerprint sensor ever to be shipped on Chrome devices. It was also a year of tablets in 2018 where we not only launched Pixel Slate, but another fan favorite from our EDU customers, the Acer Chromebook Tab 10. Um, this is when we go to bed every year, they ask for more of these devices because really, it served as a lower cost iPad replacement. And it was this lightweight, very durable tablet that teachers loved because it could weather through the, the rough environment that you know these devices often go through in a classroom environment where kids drop these devices uh, all the time. Other features that we rolled out includes the teacher center. It is a one-stop shop for training materials and resources for teachers. By this year, we were inching closer to shipping nearly 10 million units in 2018 worldwide. 
as we again grew significantly in the EDU market and started to build more traction on the consumer and enterprise market as well. 2019, uh, in 2019, with our wild success of EDU, we also want to see premium entry level devices that was also kind of considered low end. The attempt was an HP Chromebook X36012B. Um, it was priced at a mere $350, but it didn't look like any other kind of devices that we should ship before at, at that price point. This device based off the Intel GLK Gemini Lake platform touted a long 10 hour plus battery life, which we really pride ourselves in, as well as a nice three to two aspect ratio uh, and an LCD panel with a full metal body chassis to really reinforce this premium feel. It was also one of the first devices to have a USI stylus as well. Again, expanding all the use cases at, within the classroom and outside the classroom where kids can use stylus to express themselves and creatives can use stylus in their homes and in their work using a stylus as well. 2020, uh, this year, uh, well, this was the year where we also built more entry-level detachables. We heard the resounding need from the Acer Chromebook tab that there is a real market for this. And so we wanted to build a durable uh, entry-level detachable, uh, which is the Lenovo IdeaPad du Duet, priced at $279. It was a 10-inch screen. It had a detachable form factor where you can uh, dock this onto the keyboard. And it had this gray fabric uh, kind of finishing on the back. And the brightness was also very good. It was at 400 nits. And the camera uh, was also very high quality in that it was two megapixels and an eight megapixel camera uh, based off of the SoC uh, MediaTek A183. This was really intended to kind of lean into our tablet strategy and prove that there is a market for, for Chrome OS and, and a web first platform in, in these really portable devices, both in the classroom and, and outside of the classroom as well. And 2020 was also a really exciting year because it was the first super high-end device that we, we launched at about 999. Uh, it was a Samsung Galaxy Chromebook. It was a 13.3 inch 4K AMOLED display at the first time we had an AMOLED display uh, shipped. And it had this ambient EQ technology that really made the colors be similar to kind of the true colors that you see in real life. This device was razor thin. It was less than 10 millimeters thick with an aluminum chassis, chassis. And it also had a fingerprint sensor to really streamline that authentication experience. And finally, it also again had two USB-C ports uh, because we feel passionately about the value of USB-C ports moving forward, which is why we continue to contribute to the USB spec. It was based on the 10th generation Intel Comet Lake SoC so The Verge covered this as well. The Samsung Galaxy Chromebook is beautiful, fast, and expensive. It was our attempt to build a really high-end device. Um, and they, they recognized it. It was a good looking and it was a very powerful device, but the cost was obviously more expensive than, than one may expect out of a Chromebook. Uh, but we are excited about the potential that this device signals out in the market and our ability to prove that you know, Chrome OS has a place in, in high-end uh, premium devices and just more advanced use cases as well. So thank you again for joining this meeting, this, this discussion. Our journey was long. It's been a 10-year journey. We went from a market that was a highly skeptical one about our right to play in this market to, to one where we're almost seeing almost 50 plus million active users on our platforms um, with significant high user satisfaction rates and a majority share in the education space. 
But we will not stop here. Our journey continues, and, and it's certainly an exciting place to be. And we hope that understanding of the history helps you understand the trajectory again that we are on as Chrome OS, where we can continue to evangelize our voice and what computing can be, uh, computing that should be simple, speedy, secure, and intelligent, uh, which are the core pillars that we really believe in. So thank you so much again for joining. We, we hope you enjoyed this, this conversation. So we do have a question, it seems. So the question is, with so many Chromebooks available for sale, I sometimes get confused on what to buy. What do you suggest? Also, a lot of them are often sold out. Um, so I think, some basic suggestions is, you know, we are always updating our devices, the components that we ship on the hardware and the OS too. So really try to get the latest devices that we have to offer. Um, they're usually stocked up at the major retailers and online channels as well. Um, it really depends on what you're looking for and the price range you want to play in. In the low end, we've shipped exciting devices like the HP Chromebook that I talked about before and the high end, the Galaxy Chromebook can really serve a lot of interesting use cases. And so I'd, I'd look into what your needs are, think about maximizing the, the support of the device by ensuring you take the latest device and, and just surfing and seeing what the other users have to say about the device. So again, that's all the questions that we have. Uh, excited to share this journey with you, and we hope you learned a thing or two about how we got to where we are today and, and the exciting journey we have ahead, ahead of us. Thank you again, and uh, enjoy the rest of Chrome University.